Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to see you, um, to see some of the same names that we had, we hosted uh, the webinar last week. Um, welcome to this continuity uh, plan webinar. Uh, for those of you who attended last week, uh, welcome again. And for those of you who are new, um, uh, we hope the session will be uh, useful uh, for you as well. Um, in this uncert uncertain time, our main goal is to support our, our partners and our clients in, in anything we can really uh, do. And in this scenario, uh, we realize that probably the best thing we can do at the moment is share our own experience and, and see if it can be useful to um, any of you um, going through the same thing. Uh, we acknowledge that each one of your companies is different and you might not be experiencing the same or you might not have the same resources or um, the same capabilities but we still hope that you can take something from those webinars that can be applied in your company uh, and help you to deal with the COVID-19 uh, implications. Um, we'll, today, present, uh, today we have three co-hosts, uh, my, myself, Amy Stan. Uh, I've been with Beza for uh, over four years now, um, and I'm in charge of organization development and culture. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to be uh, helping you with the questions and answers um, um, and making sure that we cover um, everything that you would like to know. Uh, we also have uh, Baha. Uh, Baha is our VP Finance. Uh, Baha, you can wave um, to people. Um, he has joined us last uh, he has over nine years of experience, ranging from big multinationals to a regional startup. His latest role was um, uh, in finance as well in a regional startup back in Palestine. Um, he, uh, over the last few weeks, he has worked uh, tirelessly with executive team and leadership team to set up our business continuity plan. Therefore, he will be the one presenting. Uh, we also have Safwan with us. Uh, he's our product manager and specializing in different financial products, uh, offering from Bezat his portfolio. Uh, he has also been with Bezat for over four years, uh, having different roles uh, starting in insurance sales and eventually moving to product. Um, Safwan will use this time to ask a couple of questions that we uh, will help us to uh, have a better, um, a better product for all of you. Um, so he'll be uh, asking those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, this session is aimed at the finance and HR professionals, uh, but uh, as well, it, it can be highly beneficial to the business owners. Um, so without further ado, um, uh, just a little bit about Bezat. I mean, most of you are our clients, so you already know about Bezat. Um, but for those who are, you, who are prospects, Bezat is a technology company that provides insurance and HR solution. Our goal is to make World Class Employee Experience accessible to every, um, every SME. We went live in April 2013. Um, and we automate uh, uh, payroll and HR processes uh, for, uh, for SME, um, uh, SME clients. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Baha um, um, to start his, uh, his presentation. Thank you, Tania, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar today. Uh, so as Tania actually mentioned, uh, so today we are, we are trying to share uh, our experience uh, in business continuity planning and financial analysis uh, in the crisis time, like the one that we are going through currently. Uh, so in this that we actually started our exercise uh, of writing our business continuity plan more than a month ago. Uh, we were very early in drafting our plan and communicating it across uh, all the company. So, and uh, part of uh, drafting the plan, we had to do a lot of research and uh, understanding of how uh, to put together a business continuity plan. I think uh, today the main goal is to share these lessons across with all of you and uh, listen to your questions and concerns and share ideas. And then we're, get, we're going to move to financial planning to uh, also touch on how Bizat uh, approached financial planning uh, for this crisis and uh, what lessons that we need to learn uh, at the moment. So, um, so recently we've been hearing a lot about business continuity planning. It's, uh, it's an old term, but it surfaced recently because of the crisis that faced every single organization worldwide. Uh, if you see on 
uh, of the presentation. This is taken from Google Trends. It's showing the uh, number of searches for business continuity plan. And if you see like that the numbers just jumped up over the last two months, the number of people who are searching for business continuity plan have increased significantly across the world. And the United Arab Emirates is the fourth on the list in terms of interest uh, for searching for business continuity plan, which means that many organizations that uh, are in the UEE now, they're interested in drafting their first uh, business continuity plan or probably changing it to accommodate this new reality. So to explain what a business continuity plan is a generic term that uh, might uh, have a lot of things under it. It can be, it has interchangeable meanings, uh, depends on uh, where you live in the world and which industry you come from. But in general, uh, there are three things that uh, define what a business continuity plan. First of all, is it's a risk management tool. It means that it's a tool that allows us to assess our risks and uh, design mitigating uh, procedures for these risks. It's a proactive planning approach, which means that uh, business continuity plans are drafted before a crisis happens and before an incident happens, uh, which requires looking uh, into the future and trying to understand what risks can face our businesses or organizations. And it, finally, it uses the what if a scenario analysis, uh, which means that uh, we have to uh, define specific scenarios that uh, we might be affected by the based on these scenarios we need to plan accordingly and it, th there's uh, no doubt that it's very important because without proper uh, planning we will not be able to plan at the time of crisis at the time of crisis everybody is in emergency mode uh, everyone is trying just to get things uh, uh, solved as soon as possible and planning requires time to brainstorm to put together uh, procedures and identify goals, which needs to happen before the crisis happens. Uh, now in the COVID-19, like I think most of uh, the companies were a little bit late to, to, to do this exercise, but it's not too late because we are living in an uh, ever-changing environment now and more risks and scenarios might happen. So we need to start planning today if we have not started. Uh, the second benefit of having uh, business continuity plan is that it minimizes costs and damages once an incident happens or, or a crisis hits. And uh, it ensures that we recover our business operations as soon as this crisis goes away. Uh, finally, in also in the, uh, amid COVID-19, we all as organizations need to be responsible to our society and community. So we need to plan uh, carefully to meet our uh, responsibilities to our customers, vendors, and all of our stakeholders. So there's uh, an ethical uh, part of it. Uh, so the business continuity planning is a continuous process. It does not start and stop at a certain point. It's a, it's a mindset in, in the organizational mindset that needs to be implemented and it needs to be updated every now and then and tested. But, you know, like uh, part of the business continuity plan uh, are, are some components of it are actually shorter, like emergency planning, crisis management, recovery, uh, disaster recovery plans. They all have been uh, at certain points of time and tackled certain scenarios. But business continuity planning or management, it's, a, it's an approach rather than a document. Um, it's very important uh, to know that before we can start drafting a business continuity plan, we have to follow uh, a methodology that, uh, that will help us uh, write an effective one. And this methodology requires four steps. Uh, the first one is risk assessment. Second one is business impact analysis. Third, strategy and plan development. And lastly, uh, the testing part. Uh, we'll, we're going to go and cover each one uh, uh, deep enough uh, and, uh, and talk about how uh, this, each of these steps can be executed before we start the, uh, drafting the plan. So for risk assessment, uh, it's the first step and it starts definitely with having an understanding of our business. So if we understand our business and its operations and environment, then we can 
start thinking about different scenarios that could happen to our to our business because our industry is more prone to specific risks or our geography is more prone to specific risks that can uh, constitute together a single scenario that will affect our business. Um, then after we identify these scenarios, we need to be able to uh, assign probability scores and try to rank all these scenarios based on their probability to happen to our business to uh, prioritize the ones that are uh, more probable than others. Finally, we, we also live in a very complex world uh, where scenarios don't happen in isolation. Rather, uh, sometimes one scenario happens and a follow-up scenario happens next. So uh, good planning requires considering also complex scenarios. So uh, combining two to three scenarios together sometimes uh, might make us more prepared than just considering each scenario separately. Brainstorming risk is, uh, is a, a very tough, uh, uh, I'd say, like task to do. It requires a lot of like brainstorming and requires uh, uh, ability to uh, like to initiate dialogue across the organization to understand what risks that may face us. But there is a single mind map that we can use uh, when we identify the major scenario. Then from the major scenario, we identify follow up scenarios or minor scenarios and we assign the probabilities to each one based on our expectation. So this is one example where we have pandemic, then there's a partial lockdown, then a continued lockdown, then extended lockdown, which is happening. I mean, we don't know like if a complete lockdown will happen, but we're assigning 50% probability to that happening. And on, on the right side, we're trying to understand well, how, how that would affect our operations and business and try to understand how we, we need to be prepared. Now we'll move to the second step in the methodology, which requires mapping these risks and scenarios to our business processes and operations. So we know like if we, if we identify a scenario and we understand all the risks under this scenario, we have to understand how that's specifically affecting our business. What, and on, on operational level, how our business would be affected. And the, all, the best way to do it is to map the risks to all the business processes that we have. So for example, let's say we have uh, one risk that one key supplier is uh, ha having major delays in fulfilling orders because of the breakdown of the supply chain across the world after COVID-19. This probably will affect the number of escalations on uh, to the sales teams because uh, our order fulfillment uh, process would be affected. Then the second week, if this sustains, then we have more canceled orders, refunds. On on a, after one month, we have uh, lost customers. On the other side, like finance will also be affected because there will be more errors in the invoices that will be issued to our customers. Then. Uh, our daily sales outstanding will increase because these customers won't be paying on time and breaking down these risks across the different processes help us tackle each one individually and be more focused. Very important here is to gather feedback from and input from all of your teams and uh, try to engage as many people as possible because uh, this will have more coverage if more people are involved. Now we get to the next step, which is the actual plan development, which is uh, drafting our, our plan, which I uh, recognize that it's based on four pillars. And these four pillars are shown in the uh, boxes, the four boxes on the screen. And the first one is resources. So with resources, we need to understand to execute the business continuity plan uh, what resources, I mean human resources we need, and what other resources that these human resources we need to execute the plan. So we need to assign emergency coordinators and assign clear responsibilities to them uh, and make sure that they understand the responsibilities. The second uh, pillar is emergency response planning. As I said, business continuity plan is more a uh, continuous approach, so we need to be able to identify what we need to do in a short, a very short term, uh, very short period uh, 
by looking at triggers for emergencies, what could trigger a scenario or a trigger a risk. And then from there, we need to come up with procedures. And these procedures need to be done within a timeline to address the emergency. And we need to make sure that once we start, uh, we enter the emergency mode, our processes can accommodate to this new emergency and can uh, be, uh, be changed accordingly. So we need some change management aspect here, which requires that we analyze our processes and try to identify if we have a f uh, failure points in our processes. So for example, if we're depending a lot on working from office, if we, limit, if we have been operating this way for many years, then all of a sudden we have to do remote work. We have to realize that maybe the customer service process needs to be redesigned to accommodate uh, remote work because at the failure uh, point of uh, customer service process for example is that it's depending on face-to-face -face, uh, interaction also we have to think about our infrastructure readiness if we want to go and start working from home we need uh, the telecom uh, tools we need uh, uh, also like you know the communication tools that will allow us to uh, have all our meetings to send uh, uh, the documents that we need to exchange across our company make sure we have a crm online to update uh, our business um, and Finally, we need to look also at stakeholders. Uh, we have to conduct the stakeholders analysis, which means that we need to think about the business continuity impact on all of our st stakeholders, including staff, customers, and vendors. And this is specifically important because it helps uh, uh, make sure that it sharpens our plan. Uh, now when it comes to drafting the actual business continuity plan, uh, there is uh, no single uh, structure that uh, is used globally, but there are items that need to be included in the, in the plan uh, that they're very important because they give more clarity and they allow uh, the plan to be uh, better understood by all of its users. So we have to start with identifying what our objectives are, why are we drafting this plan, what we are trying to achieve from having a business continuity plan. Then we have to identify our scope, what is this related to, and which business area, which uh, business uh, risks that we are trying to identify here. So in the context of COVID-19, most of us will be writing uh, BCPs with the scope of that and the uh, uh, risks that are coming after uh, COVID-19. Uh, we need to identify the scenarios that we uh, brainstormed in uh, the first step of the methodology. We have to also list all our risks that we are facing across the company. Then identifying the roles and responsibilities of uh, participants in the plan. We have to also, for each scenario, to identify the emergency response plan with its procedures. So uh, structuring our BCP in this uh, structure Will allow it will allow us uh, to be more clear on what uh, how that will be executed. Finally, um, a plan without um, testing, without communication, is useless. So we need to make sure that once we have uh, the plan that is communicated well with all of the stakeholders and they understand uh, their responsibilities within the plan. We need to, if possible, conduct some trail tests or try to partially implement the plan and see how, uh, how things are going. And if it needs any, any adjustments, we need to adjust accordingly. And we need to also always update our plan. I would suggest like on a bi-weekly basis, take a look again and see if something is obsolete or something needs to be added to the plan and re-communicate with everyone. So this is pretty much everything uh, that uh, business continuity plan uh, in, in includes. Uh, it's, uh, the process could take uh, probably a week if uh, you want to do it uh, uh, in a very structured manner, uh, but it all depends on the size of the business and the industry and the risks as we mentioned in the beginning. Um, 
Guys, now, if you have uh, we'll any questions, you can, uh, you can type your questions and uh, we'll, uh, Baha will answer those after his second part of presentation, which is financial planning. So if you have any questions, you can start typing them and we'll come back to them in uh, about like uh, five, ten minutes. Cool. Thank you. So I'll jump to the next topic, which is financial planning, uh, which is as uh, more, probably more important at this, uh, this time, uh, even more than business continuity plan, because uh, what we're seeing right now is uh, very impactful. So some of the financial impacts of COVID-19 is uh, economic uncertainty and market volatility. We're seeing more like lack of liquidity in the market and uh, frozen real economy or global GDP is expected to drop significantly this year uh, as a result of uh, the slowdown due to social distancing. And finally, like we're seeing uh, more like unemployment rates going up uh, in many countries, which is uh, affecting us. So unfortunately, many uh, big organizations like uh, the International Monetary Fund and uh, the World Bank, they're speaking now about 100% uh, recession scenario. The question is how we get out of this recession and how we recover from the recession. It's something that we cannot tell right now. But uh, we need to be prepared for uh, the upcoming uh, situation. I mean, it's a recession that will last for more than uh, probably nine months at least. So having uh, we having financial our uh, financial houses prepared is very important. So the first uh, step is like for the first time, like many of the finance executives they focus on their income statements on their day-to-day -day activity. They want to make sure they're generating enough revenue uh, to the company. They want to make sure that the business uh, plan is. Uh, or the budget is being uh, uh, followed as uh, and targets are being achieved. For the first time, uh, we need to shift our focus a little bit to balance sheet and start assessing liquidity because uh, we have to enter a survival mode. And from a financial perspective, financial survival is all dependent on how much cash a company has and how much cash it can generate uh, in the short term. So we have to stress less, uh, test our liquidity by stress testing our liquidity. Uh, uh, I mean, as showing uh, how resilient is our uh, working capital is and how we can meet our obligations in the near future and uh, make sure that our revenue is converting into cash as quickly as possible. But before we can do this, we have to add a very important uh, issue which is the visibility over and the movement of cash and the predictability of cash which requires uh, us to first of all have the tools for actually uh, having real-time visibility into what's happening to our cash balances and how it's changing over time and brainstorm scenarios that will affect our cash. Uh, it requires us to also look at our budget which we uh, possibly locked at 31st December last year, we need to unlock it and start reforecasting uh, our revenue, our expenses, and we have to reforecast uh, our working capital according to the new reality. And we have to address any issues we have currently with uh, financial reporting and analysis capabilities. So if we don't have the accounting systems, we don't have uh, the right uh, data visualization tools that will allow us to actually track uh, important KPIs, we, start, we have to work on this right now. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, our visibility will become uh, uh, very far away from the reality and we, will face, uh, we won't be able to respond to, uh, at the right time. Now, every single company has different elements in its working capital, but the most uh, common elements that we see across all industries are uh, accounts receivable and vendors payable. And uh, for accounts receivable, it's very important, it's a very tough time in terms of liquidity, so we need to make sure that our accounts receivable is analyzed. And uh, when we do analysis, we, uh, we have done the analysis in this based on industry. So because some industries took uh, a faster hit than other industries, so 
probably the outstanding accounts receivable might be more affected from certain industries uh, in the short term. And understanding this and assigning risk scores to each uh, bucket of your accounts receivable is very important. Um, as well as like many of us probably did not do the best job in benchmarking ourselves, uh, our working capital KPIs to other uh, companies in the industry. So at this moment, what we need to do is to understand if there is room for improvement that we could have taken in the past and, and just uh, take the grab the chance to improve the last, uh, the last mile of our working capital. So if we were not following up on invoices like you know, uh, right on time, if we were not doing enough in terms of collection, we have to uh, speed up collection. We have to make sure that uh, we tighten all our measures on credit control and uh, make sure that we're operating efficiently right now. Finally, vendors' Bible is very important as well, as because at this time, uh, if your accounts receivable cycle is being delayed because of customers' payments, then you have to make sure that your payable cycle mirror your receivable cycle. Otherwise, you will your cash flow will take a hit very quickly. And uh, ensuring that you do an analysis over your current contracts with your vendors and start negotiating them is very important. Finally, we all also depend on other funding sources outside our working capital to fund our liquidity, which might come from our creditors like banks or maybe our investors. And you know, like in this environment, uh, nothing is certain. So even your funding sources are exposed to some risks. So it's very important to realize that we need to assess the exposure of our funding sources and start diversifying our funding sources immediately. And eventually, like every single company that uh, has, is facing uh, cash flow uh, issues, need to start uh, embarking on a contingency funding plan to help survive through uh, this period. Uh, this is a timeline for when we need to start optimizing our working capital in a crisis term. So they're very short and they're very demanding. But if we don't actually start this quick and this fast, we will find ourselves in a hard spot. Uh, so as you see, like one to two, 20 days to reduce late payments, which might have been, uh, uh, have been there for maybe several months, but we need to close all of this late payment issues today. We have to shorten our credit terms. We have to protect our cash position as soon as possible. Uh, other than uh, liquidity and cash uh, optimization, we also need to start looking at our cost because to be able to sustain our business, we, we realize that our revenue will drop in a recession. Most companies and most industries get affected negatively by uh, the, the drop in demand uh, on their products and services. And to be able to sustain the same uh, your company might have or uh, whatever like you know uh, EBITDA that you are used to EBITDA margin as a percentage of your revenue you have to start looking at your cost comparing to your revenue so cost restructuring is very important it is uh, it's very critical in period it's, you we can take uh, take a smaller measures at the beginning uh, for restructuring our cost by removing weight and uh, tackling inefficiencies. And then we start like, you know, uh, removing uh, and cutting non-value, non-essential costs that don't add any value to the business. And we have to start thinking about how we can automate uh, the processes that we have to decrease our cost per transaction. Uh, this need to be done uh, gradually, but uh, they need to start very soon because without uh, considering this, uh, the cost restructuring will find uh, our business in a very difficult uh, time uh, where our cost is exceeding our revenues, uh, probably. And then if, even if we were breaking even, we'll find that the business is not breaking even anymore. Very important to negotiate contracts at this time because uh, it's uh, a time where negotiation, uh, that the situation is very ripe for negotiation contracts. So you have to look at all your pending contracts and 
negotiate with large and small vendors uh, at the same time. And you have to uh, identify if any of these contracts are unsuitable for this period, which means like if we have been committing to a certain monthly minimum volume uh, for a discount, probably this is irrelevant to this period because our uh, demand will drop, then we don't need that uh, uh, debt commitment to be on our contract. Uh, finally, uh, uh, we need to be able also to take all of uh, these cost restructuring and uh, cost cut measures that we have implemented and uh, put into our model or our, our budget and see how that will affect our cash flow uh, for the next, uh, let's say, nine months at least, where we see the impact and uh, how our cash flow is changing. Is there any gaps and where we will need liqu more liquidity in certain months? And this will help us actually plan uh, better for uh, uh, our contingency funding. Uh, because like also seasonality plays a big role here. So some industries have uh, high seasonality and, and low seasonality months. In those seasonality months, they probably will run out of cash. Then they will need like uh, to, to have a short funding plan until they can collect their receivables. Um, finally, I, this is uh, the last thing I will cover in my presentation. Then uh, I will uh, open uh, the the I will, I will start taking the questions and answering these questions. Also, my colleagues of one will step in to understand uh, more about uh, your pain points and uh, that are related to these two points, the two topics that uh, we discussed today. So, as as finance executives, I think we have play a very important role in the time of crisis and uh, being able to help the company is the most precious thing that we can do uh, in our careers. So the first uh, role that we have is to improve visibility of uh, our company to our financials. So if we've been uh, closing late, if we've been not being able to provide visibility in real time, or in a very short period, it's time to work on this and start to providing this visibility. The second one is to try to be the economist of the organization. By this, I mean, start connecting the dots between what's happening on a macroeconomic level and on a, on a day-to-day -day, uh, operations level, and try to see how, how these macroeconomic factors will end up impacting your business. The third one is like being able to implement the forward looking uh, planning methodology within your company. If your company has not been very worried about the future in the past, it's the time where, when you should be worried about the future. And the only way you can uh, to navigate the risks that are coming to your business is by implementing the forward looking planning. Also, it's the time when everyone needs to work together to. Uh, overcome this period at uh, the time when operations, sales, finance, and other departments need to cooperate more than ever. So being a leader and initiating projects that are cross-functional is very important. Uh, try to communicate as much as possible your concerns to your executive team and your team leaders to get their support and uh, their backup and uh, solving uh, the financial struggle that your company might go through. Finally, you should start being a little bit more creative because uh, conventional solutions won't work now. Whatever we're used to in the past might not be relevant now. So we need to think outside the box. We need to start considering things that we said no to in the past and uh, come up with new ideas and share them with our, uh, with our teams. So that's pretty much everything now. Uh, we'll move to the Q&A session or probably just one wants to talk a little bit first. Uh, we have a few questions. So um, guys, you can type any questions. Uh, we have a few questions we can answer. I think one of them uh, is me and another one for, for Baha. So I'll start with the first one. Um, how can HR help during this time of crisis considering the perspective of employee and employer? Um, I think the HR, HR team as such plays essentially the three roles about uh, or like has three tasks uh, in their hands in this time. Um, number one task is um, making sure that people are able to work from home 
those who can work and whose jobs permit to actually work from home. So uh, being at the forefront in terms of arranging the work from home uh, practices, logistics of it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We covered this in the in the previous webinar. So that's one. Once they are set up and ready to work from home, and they've been uh, and they are productive. The same thing that HR now plays a role, which mostly um, you wouldn't find HR plays this role uh, otherwise, is thinking and, and ensuring the mental health of, of your employees. Um, I mean, it's really tough, and especially on di different uh, living conditions people are having, it can be very tough and lonely journey for them not to be able to get out of the house and move um, uh, here and there to be able to buy everything they want, etc. So thinking about the mental well-being of your employees is the is the core function now of HR. Um, and few things you can you can implement is like checking more, uh, you know, calling and checking in with them, uh, arranging some group calls and just discussions, playing games. Um, you can um, uh, you can arrange different places and play them via Zoom, for example. Um, making sure that everyone is connected and everyone feels a sense of belonging. I think that's an important role. And the three third thing is uh, is is really over -communic communicating of what's happening. I think as an employee, uh, the the first thing that they are worried most is actually, am I getting fired as a result of it? Um, and I think your role is without sugar coating, actually, uh, you know, um, communicating to what's going to happen, what's the scenarios, um, and how that will potentially might affect them, so they can prepare. Um, and for that, you will have to involve yourself with the with the finance team, with the executives, with the CEO of the company to understand like how. Uh, how, like how much runway do you have? What cost can you cut? Like, uh, you know, what's the projection for your sales, um, and how that would affect and and really openly communicating it with the with the team, so everyone knows uh, potentially what to expect. So it doesn't. They can make also their alternative arrangements in parallel. Um, an example of that could be that for some employees there might be a lease coming up for renewal, and they either um, move to a smaller partner or they uh, move out and potentially work from from their home countries till the time that over to cut their cost um, or um, or maybe you know helping them to renegotiate their lease even if it's not coming for the renewal so those are those are the things that the um, um, that HR is really important uh, important uh, responsible for um, the other question is how can, I think it's more for Baha for you, how can we do cross-cutting with, without firing employees or maybe, or cutting their salaries? How can we do cross-cutting without firing employees or without cutting their salaries? Is there an answer? Um, there is no like single answer to this question. It depends again on the industry. Some industries are more labor intensive than others. Uh, the majority of the cost uh, at the cost is in actually salaries and to be able to make a real difference is we uh, you cannot avoid not having salary cuts because this is the your structure and a significant amount of your cost goes to salaries and everything else might be like you know less uh less in terms of like you know uh importance to your uh, uh, company in uh, your business model uh, so you can cut a little bit here and there but uh, but you you cannot avoid not cutting the salary cuts in other industries where uh, the human factor is uh, not very like you know important in the cost structure or maybe the, uh, some some companies have a significant level of automation of their processes uh, I think cost might not make a big difference. and They have to think about other uh, areas to cut cost. So it, the, the best way to understand if you can actually decrease uh, the percentage of your cost of your salary cut is by doing an analysis over all your expenses and it really like, you know, open a discussion about their importance to your business. Like many times I've seen that companies think that this expense is very important and we can, can be eliminated. But after uh, some discussion, uh, they realize that it's not that important as they thought and uh, they can uh, cut it. They cut it and life goes on normally after that. Um, probably the best way to uh, 
help your employees is by start looking at these costs before you jump to cost cutting the salary cuts. Um, any questions from anyone? Also, could be the things that we didn't cover today. So something, especially if you haven't been part of the previous webinar, um, and I'm interested to hear some of the elements. While we are waiting for answers, um, uh, we actually have some questions for you. Um, and I'll pass into Safwan to be able to ask them. Um, hey, everyone. Um, thank you, Baha, for the, for the presentation. It was really insightful. Um, so, guys, from my side, I think, the, uh, I think Tania already gave you an introduction about myself. So I'm the product manager at Bayzab. And the, all, the overall objective for me is to understand in this current situation how you're coping uh, up with certain things. I have a few questions. So what I would recommend um, you guys to do is you can click on the chat button and you can select the option, um, all panelists. Or if you want, um, if you're okay with displaying your answers to other participants, you can also select the other option as well, which is all participants and panelists and respond to the questions. And these are going to be just one or two liners to the max, and some of them are yes or no questions. I won't be taking more than 10 to 12 minutes of your time um, because I only have seven questions. So um, I would really, really appreciate um, everyone participating and responding to these questions because it really helps us in defining and shaping the product that will be definitely helping you, um, you know, moving forward. Um, so having said that, I will just start off with the questions. Meanwhile, if you have any questions to Baha, please feel free to type that in as well. So um, moving on to the first question. Data is now um, very critical for most of us to make the decisions, um, especially during this uh, COVID uh, situation. So the first question to you guys is, how are you getting the data today to make decisions, um, especially on cost cuts, such as number of employees to be you know, laid off or given a salary cut, gratuity liability, and also potentially looking at um, how, may, how much do you owe for an employee in terms of their you know, end of service? So that can be an inclusion of gratuity plus you know, leave balances, et cetera. So how do you get this data today? So the answer could be you have a software today, or you have an Excel file, or you're not involved probably, so you have someone else helping you with that. All answers are welcome. Um, so you can type in your responses in the chat and uh, that will really help us understand how we can take the next steps in solving this problem specifically for you. Someone, do you want to type the question? Uh, oh yeah, people started answering. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. You can also copy your question to the. Um, the, chat. To the chat. I will. Also. I will do that as well. So again, just the first, just to reiterate the first question: How do you get data to make such decisions around cost minimization? I'll just type it in, actually, so everyone can see. Thank you guys, we've already been getting few responses. Um, I will move on to the second question, but for those of you who are already typing the responses, please continue doing that. And I'll move on to the, the second question. One of the major costs um, um, that the company incurs today is health insurance. Having said that, how have your perspective changed on um, the health insurance policies for your employees? By perspective on health insurance, I mean, have you decided to look into alternate options? Or maybe when it comes for renewal, have you thought about reducing the cost like significantly by compromising on benefits? 
So these could be some of the answers that you have uh, already thought about. So how have you considered um, or how has your perspective on health insurance changed given the current circumstances? I've also typed the question in here so you can read through and give me a response. Um, so yeah. If you have not changed your perspective on insurance, you can also be saying, you know, you know what, uh, it's going to be the same or it's not a big responsibility for all of us. So. All right, so in, let me move on to the third question. But again, as I said, if you're already typing in, please feel free to continue typing and leave your responses. The third question I have is, what are some of the concerns that you have heard the most from your employees with regards to their personal finances? To give you an example, um, for Bezat, a lot of our employees were asking us and the HR on how um, how can they manage their you know personal loans and you know motor loans etc. And they were inquiring about any information that we have on any um, you know um, policies or frameworks or relaxations that the government has introduced or the banks have introduced. So this this is just one example. Um, but how has it happened in your organization? So have employees come or did they come over to you and ask you about um, their personal finance related situation and assistance to solving their problem today? If yes, what, what was it all about? And if they have it, you could also type in, you know, my employees have not come and asked for it. That's also a, a, a response that I'm expecting because that is also possible, right? So you could type it um, in either ways and yeah. I'll also type in the question again on the chat so everyone can see what uh, the question I asked was about. And again, one thing that uh, I think we all um, spoke about was about employees uh, morale and uh, one of the questions was also around how can you reduce costs without um, laying off or deducting salaries from employees? Because again, the, the thought process in mind is how can they maintain employee morale and productivity? So it's really important that employees will definitely be asking or will be worried at least about their personal finances at this stage. So we would really love to understand if that has happened in the organization and if so, what were they specifically worried about? Okay, we have a few responses, which is good. But I really appreciate more of them to come over because this is uh, a key element or uh, a key area we as a product team are trying to focus on. All right, I will move on to the fourth question. Um, so, Bezat has moved to a work from home arrangement. And I'm pretty sure that most of you have also moved to a work from home arrangement. So for those companies who have, what was the biggest challenge for your business while moving into this arrangement? It's a more open-ended question. So it can be around you know, managing assets or resources. For example, you didn't have laptops and you wanted to source them or your employees were not having enough space or you know, um, other um, you know, required assets to work properly, et cetera. So it could be anything. So even if you haven't moved from a work from, if, if, you, if you haven't moved to a work from home arrangement, you could also type that in. They are still working from the office. 
So what was your biggest challenge as an organization in moving to a work from home arrangement? I've also typed in the question for more visibility. All right, I think we have a couple of responses. Please continue to type in whatever you have been typing so far. Um, again, um, the, um, I would like to emphasize on the fact that it's really important for us to get as many responses as we can. So it really helps us shape the product. And in the end, it will be definitely helpful for you as well. Um, the fifth question I have is again, focus on companies that have moved to a work from home arrangement. So what measures have you taken to ensure employees remain productive in their work? One of, the, one of the worries of an organization is that if I ask them to work from home, I won't have control over them and I won't know what they will be working on. Or I don't know if my employees will remain productive because the amount of distractions that they will have at home will be higher. So how or what are some of the measures you have taken to ensure that they remain productive in, the, in, in, the, in their work? Some of the examples could be, um, you know, I have asked my employees to share their daily activities via Excel or via WhatsApp messages, or you already have a tool where you have to update. So one of the response I see is that there was a, there is a CRM that they use to basically um, list out the daily deliverables of an employee and whether they have completed it or not. So it could be that. Or it could be, um, I have prepared, let's say a work from home guide and I trust my employees that they will read that guide and they will ensure that, you know, they follow the procedures and protocols in the guide that will help them remain productive. These are just, you know, two potential answers, but it could also be anything else because we don't have visibility into what um, is happening in your organization. And again, if you don't have a work from home arrangement yet, you could also type that in and say, you know what, we don't have a work from home arrangement yet. So we don't know what it's going to be like. Perfect. I think I have a few answers there. I will move on to the sixth question. Um, we only have two more questions and I really hope everybody participate in the next uh, two questions. So one of the key concerns of an employer is to ensure employee morale is not affected under these circumstances. Um, it affects their productivity and that's definitely not something a company would be looking forward to. So what measures have you taken today to ensure your employees morale doesn't go down? So this could be, let's say um, your company has provided some financial assistance to the employees to stay them motivated. Or this could be um, any other measures, be it financial or non-financial that you have taken. So it can be a coaching um, sessions that you have organized, or it could be something very basic as a daily catch up with your you know, CEO or mentor, where the employees can you know, share their um, you know, problems and ask for suggestions and consult with someone senior or someone who has more exposure to it. So these are some of the potential responses which you can type in. And especially companies who have started to work from home, this is also another concern because now people are confined to a very restricted space, right? So um, maybe they're living alone as well, so they don't have anyone to talk to. So that could also affect their morale. So an initiative could be around having frequent chats and communication within the employees itself. So have you implemented any of those? Um, if you haven't implemented any, it's also fair for you to respond that, you know, we haven't thought about it. I see some really interesting responses and uh, it's really nice. Um, 
if you are typing uh, your responses, please continue to do that. And having said that, let me move on to the, the last question. So the session was definitely helpful, Baha. It really helps us understand how to plan our financials moving forward and how to prepare a business continuity plan. So one of the key elements of your financials is your employees payroll. So one of the questions was again directed to how can we ensure that we maintain or minimize the cost by not affecting employee salaries. But the question I have for you guys is what have what changes have you made to the employees um, you know payroll? Have you thought about making any changes? And if so, um, what are some of the things that you're thinking about? in terms of making changes. If you haven't made any changes, have you ever wished you had someone to consult with? For example, like you have a session, you, you had a session earlier with Baha, where he talked about uh, some of the things that you could um, consider. Um, are you looking forward to having more of similar sessions with you know, other experts or with Baha itself to consult and understand if such measures need to be taken? And this can be on employees payroll specifically, if you are thinking about how to uh, make changes over there, or it can also be on a generic level on cost minimization. Great. So I see some responses here, which is very good. Um, please feel free to type more questions for responses. And again, if you have any questions to Baha, please go ahead and make utmost use of Baha because uh, it will be really helpful and insightful for you in the end. Thank you very much for participating. And I really, really appreciate the responses everyone has put through and it will really help us in shaping and defining the, the way we want our product to move on. And especially given in this current circumstance, um, we are trying to make a great drift in the way we are focusing on our product development. So these responses would really be beneficial and helpful. Once again, thank you very much. And I hand it over back to Tanya. Um, yeah, we have one more question, which is uh, literally the freshest news of the press. So ministry, um, uh, ministry has announced on their social media that in light of the current situation, private companies companies are now allowed to temporarily modify work contracts or implement unpaid leave. Would you be able to give us uh, some clarity on these terms? Uh, it is true we also saw it on the, um, on the news and I think it's more clarification also to what's actually already in the law. Uh, in the law on one part it does say that you are not allowed to modify or decrease or send people unpaid leave but there is also action which says that uh, in unprecedented uh, circumstances um, you are actually allowed to do that and pandemic definitely falls under that so we uh, we kind of understood this even before the news came out that you are um, allowed to do that however um, as there is uh, also mentioning uh, when you modify people's uh, agreement or contract the employee has to agree to it it is true it has to be a mutual agreement um, uh, so you don't get into trouble and what to do if the employee doesn't refuse to do that um, I think it's a good question uh, um, that you guys are answering. I think um, you need to lay out options and be very transparent in terms of what are the options that employee can take. Um, in some situation, it could be that, well, it either we're implementing, you know, uh, unpaidly we're implementing um, a four days week, as you mentioned, or we are, uh, we are cutting salaries across the board. You either take this, what we are doing in order to sustain us, or you are also allowed to leave at any given time and we will calculate your salary on and gratuity on the basis of your current salary. So there should be always an option that employee has to choose. Uh, and I think that will be easier for them to understand what they want to do. And maybe some of them, it's fair enough, if some of them will decide to leave and just say, well, actually, I'm better off closing everything and either um, leaving to my home country, waiting what's going to happen or, uh, you know, trying to find something. Although in this time, 
it's also our responsibility as HR to be able to explain to people the economical impact uh, that COVID has um, and the fact that all jobs are affected and finding a new job is, is not really a possibility at the moment for a lot of sectors or for most of the sectors in, in reality. Um, we are consulting uh, since the new just came out. We are also consulting PwC. They are a trusted partner in, in any legal um, uh, questions that we have. Um, and we will be uh, potentially hosting another webinar with PwC on uh, the law changes which came and you know how to um, how to actually comply with the law and support the MPs. Uh, we are checking that possibility. So stay uh, stay connected in case. Um, uh, we do uh, when we announce on, on those webinars. Um, it would be helpful, I think, as a last point, if you uh, guys, if you have anything that we didn't cover yet, especially if you've been to our two webinars, something that you would like us to cover, uh, please type those comments as well. We'll be happy to um, address that in our next webinars. Okay, I don't see anyone typing at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, what we will also do, thank you so much for the participation. Uh, we, as always, will be sending um, the feedback survey. It only has two questions. Uh, how you rate the session and what else, uh, you know, what was saying, what can we add? Uh, we'll release a survey today to you. Um, so please respond uh, with any comments. We don't want to take more of your time. Uh, it's been one hour now. Uh, we thank you so much and we hope that you guys found it helpful. And we hope to see you, to see you again. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.